Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I am Billy Embody. Thank you for listening. We've got a jam-packed show to get to today because SMU jammed the scoreboard with 77 points in a 77-63 win over Houston on Saturday night in Ford Stadium. Record-setting game on many levels for the Mustangs and the Cougars uh, combining to score the most points in a regular season game. This one, uh, no shortage of offense, all the shortage of defense, except for three interceptions grabbed by SMU, which, uh, as we talked about previewing the game, ultimately proved to be the difference. Clayton Toon uh, turned the ball over three times, two picks to Nick Roberts in the first half, in the second half. Jahari Rogers snagged really what was the game ceiling interception after an onside kick was recovered by the Cougars. Uh, they were able to get a shot at the end zone, but Jahari said no, and SMU was able to uh, kneel down on the ball and close out the game. Second straight win for the Mustangs, now one win away from bowl eligibility, which, look, USF just fired their coach. We'll talk about the Bulls uh, later this week, uh, but J the Jeff Scott era in Tampa is over. And you got to believe with how low the Bulls have been, the Mustangs should be able to take care of business in South Florida and get to bowl eligibility, setting up two huge games to close out this regular season. SMU still alive in the AAC championship game race. They'll need some help, uh, quite honestly, um, and things to fall their way. But uh, all their goals, at least still there uh, for them if they can handle business. Let's start with the offense. We'll get into the defense and special teams. All three phases of the game uh, for SMU are worth being talked about, both good and bad. Tanner Mordecai, 10 total touchdowns, nine passing touchdowns, seven of which came in the first half. We talked about a fast start, and boy, SMU got it. Um, and they were able to go up on Houston early, um, trading scores, 14 all, 21 14, 21 all. And then it was 21 unanswered points uh, for SMU, which proved to be ultimately the difference in this one. And, you know, watching this one back, you could tell I thought, I thought really early that this one was going to be wild. We talked about game changing special teams plays as well. Uh, Houston was able to get good field position for much of the night because of that. SMU, though, started out with good field position, four plays, 41 yards on their opening touchdown drive, which ended with a Ben Redding touchdown grab. That would become a theme among the tight ends with five touchdowns between Ben Redding and RJ Maryland. Uh, Tanner Mordecai, all the awards came in for him after this one. Um, 433 total yards for SMU in the first half. Uh, but Tanner Mordecai finished uh, with a, a, an unreal stat line. I mean, one that, you know, in talking with you know, people after the game, uh, he and we mentioned this on the board for our subscribers. If you're not a subscriber, check it out. We've been dropping some notes like this uh, throughout the weekend. But uh, SMU 2024 quarterback commit Tyler Aronson was on campus for this one. Uh, and afterwards, he got a chance to talk to Tanner. And Tanner said, look, you can go elsewhere. But you could also come here and throw for nine touchdown passes in a game. So a little bit of recruiting done by Tanner Mordecai after he finished 28 of 37 for 379 yards. Also added eight carries for 55 yards in its score. Um, just hats off all around to the offense. I mean, Tyler Levine runs for uh, 147 yards in a score on 25 carries. You've got the offensive line protecting Tanner Mordecai well enough that I believe they only gave up uh, one sack on the night. Yes, one sack, and I think Rhett Lashley even noted that that might not have even been a, a true sack. Um, so you've got to give this offensive staff, and especially Tanner Mordecai, Tyler Levine, Rasheed Rice, Dylan Goffney, Ben Redding, Mucci Dixon, Jordan Curley, RJ Maryland, hats off. I mean, that is just such a special performance to be a part of if you're an SMU player. And I feel like watching it back, it was just so easy because he had so much time back there. I mean, both quarterbacks had a ton of time, and we'll get to that on SMU's end of things. But if you're Tanner Mordecai, you got that week off, and he told us, he told us that this game, you know, for him really meant a lot just because it put everything into perspective. And I, I think when 
the grind of a season is wearing on somebody like Tanner Mordecai, who's who was injured, you know, throughout the course of the season, uh, and and you know really hadn't had the chance to to recover from his injuries. That week off really helped him. I I felt like, and you know, going through the concussion protocol, it just showed him really how much he he you know kind of values football, and so. I felt like he was going to come into this game and play a, a clean football game. I mentioned that in the preview. Um, he hadn't been able to show it, but I just kind of had a gut feeling that this offense was going to really come together. I, and looking at Houston, you know, they lost to Tulane. Uh, they really hadn't got off, gotten off to good starts overall um, in the, I believe, six prior games to the SMU game. And this one was just kind of ripe for the taking uh, for SMU. Rhett Lashley's had a lot of success. Uh, Colin plays against Houston. He's 3-0, and as you mentioned, in the postgame. And, you know, building off of the physicality that SMU brought in that Tulsa game when Preston Stone went down and Kevin Henry Jennings was then forced to be, you know, the quarterback, I felt like SMU was going to be able to exploit a lot of what Houston, you know, has defensively. They came into the game with some true freshmen having to play major roles in the secondary uh, they didn't have the usual suspects on the defensive line that really made that thing go. Uh, I just had this feeling that SMU was going to be able to move the ball a good bit. My prediction was was lower just because, one, I felt like the weather was still going to be a, a factor um, on Saturday originally when, when I kind of put that prediction together. Then you also have a, a game that is usually just a little bit more physical from the defensive side from what we what we thought. There's no way in hell I was going to predict a 77-point outburst from the SMU offense um, and and have that type of success. But um, I felt like SMU is just in a better place than than Houston was. Houston played two cupcakes in league play um, and and really hadn't been challenged since kind of the first six games of their schedule. And Houston has been completely up and down this year. Tanner Mordecai took a fish, uh, took advantage of that. It seemed like every every throw he he had out there was just thrown with confidence. It had zip. He had time to step into his throws and it showed. And I still think, you know, one of the underrated parts of this game is Jordan Curley coming back because SMU's offense, we talked about this a lot, is just better with him in the, in the lineup. He had three catches for 53 yards, almost had a touchdown on that 27 yard reception, but he opens things up with his speed for this offense and you see Dylan Goffey get his opportunities. You see Rasheed Rice get his usual opportunities with two touchdowns um, on 86 yards, receiving nine catches for the night. And if Jordan Curley's able to stay healthy down the stretch, this offense can be the opposite of what it has been in the past, which is when we've seen players not be 100%. As we lost Reggie Robertson in the 2019 season um, or the 2020 season, they, they lost um, or actually they, they lost Reggie in that 2019 season too. It, it has just been something where it's always been something taking away from what makes the offense great. And this year I really, and, and we saw it with Jordan Curley last year, him being in the lineup has really helped SMU be great offensively. So I think him being back in the lineup was the biggest thing that happened going into this one. SMU is able to take advantage of a leaky Houston secondary. And you look at SMU's drives too. You know, they got set up with pretty good field position in their own right, I felt like. Um, it started with the opening drive, starting at the Houston 41. Um, and and there were also, you know, some drives that started at the Houston 27. Houston 22, off of those interceptions. Um, you, you saw them start at the Houston 45 when they got the ball on a turnovers, turnover on downs. Uh, I feel like that was a big piece of this overall. Um, is just how efficient SMU was able to be when they were given opportunities. The red zone offense continues to stay hot. Um, and all of these things are just kind of boding well for SMU to be a challenger down the stretch for the AAC. They might not get in. They, they need help, like I said. But for the first time, there's confidence in November that SMU can finish strong. Um, and that's a good thing. I don't think when they lost to Cincinnati, anyone would have picked them to beat Houston. Houston was kind of riding high. Uh, they 
They do have the firepower with Clayton Toon. SMU's defense has been wildly inconsistent this year, quite frankly. Um, but I think the program is starting to kind of settle in on this culture of playing hard for 60 minutes, sticking with it. Um, and offensively, they're starting to, starting to click. So that those are all good things coming down the stretch for SMU. So offensively, I mean, the offensive line, I think, made this one happen. You know, they gave Tanner Mordecai time uh, to find the receivers. They gave uh, running lanes, you know, to Tyler Levine and even Velton Gardner got in there. And Tanner Mordecai was more aggressive in the run game. All of those things were able to happen because of the offensive line. So um, I felt like the routes, because of who SMU had running around out there for much of the game, were cleaner, uh, more on point. Uh, I think Houston really just had to defend every bit of the field. When you have the speed of Jordan Curley and the big playmaking ability of Rasheed Rice, and Dylan Goffney has become such a reliable target whenever any quarterback at SMU looks his way as of late. Um, you've you've got to feel good about where this offense is going. And, you know, they're feeding off Tyler Levine. He's not the most, you know, dynamic guy out there. But if SMU isn't going to have a dynamic run game, which they haven't all year, maybe just let him keep banging his head into people. And that's what he's doing. And he's setting a tone. And I think the team's feeding off that. And some things, as we kind of talk about, I talked about this on the board a little bit, statistically, the SMU defense just isn't good. They're just not good. Um, but I do feel like there are times, and we've seen this in the last couple games, where when they've needed to get stops or been opportunistic, they've been able to capitalize on those. And we didn't see that early in the year. Dropped interception against UCF. Um, you know, those those type of plays really stood out to me as ones that they're now making down the stretch. So we'll get to the defense in a second. Tyler Levine, you go back and look at his yards per carry. He's just kind of good. It, nothing to write home about. I think, you know, going into the season, he probably averaged, I think, 3.8 yards per carry or something like that. Fine. That's okay. But what they needed was somebody to set the tone, and he does that. And that's why he's been able to take advantage of it, because I think players are feeding off of him and allowing him uh, to now become, I think, the the starting running back that you've got to ride, ride with the rest of the way. I, I don't have any doubt that he'll be that guy. Um, and, you know, kudos to him. No one ever has questioned Tyler Levine and how strong he is, uh, his heart, all those things. You just always look for a little bit more wiggle, but this offense might not, not need wiggle this year. They need somebody that is going to be consistent, and that's what Tyler Levine's been since he's gotten a, a bigger workload. So kudos to him. Another big night for Tyler Levine. Um, only had one rush that was uh, stopped from behind the line of scrimmage, I'm pretty sure. Just kind of looking at the stats here. So, again, you're not losing yards. You're setting yourself up for success. So uh, kudos to the offense. It was unbelievable uh, to watch. And uh, you've got to feel good about the direction they're heading down the stretch here. So moving on now to the defense. This is where, boy, there are plays that stick out and you just – you they're, you, they're just unexplainable. They had this bit, the bad second half against Tulsa. They were able to make some plays to get stops, fumble return for a touchdown, a couple stops late to seal the win. And in this game against an offense that was cooking coming in, I mean, Clayton Toon, I believe, had won two straight AAC Offense Player of the Week awards um, in three weeks, or maybe it was three straight in four weeks. You knew what you were getting yourself into. And no one rose to the challenge really outside of Nick Roberts. Uh, two big interceptions. He out muscles Keyshawn Fuller uh, for that, um, uh, Keyshawn Carter for that uh, interception, that first interception that was big. Uh, then grabs another one, steps in front of the pass. He's playing really good football right now. And I know he also got beat on a couple balls. Look, I mean, that was what was happening uh, that game. So, um, He's not, you know, immune from making you know, poor plays in the secondary either. But those type of game-changing plays, those haven't been made up until the last two weeks. The defense capitalizing on those opportunities. And there was a difference in the game. And SMU didn't turn the ball over. So um, when it comes to how, they're, how this defense should be viewed and what I was kind of talking about with Tyler Levine, and after last game, you can't necessarily say, any anything good about them 
outside of those turnovers. So let me be very clear on that. But those turnovers gave them a chance to win. And in a game like that, they made them. And so that was the difference. I feel confident, well, not confident, but better about where the defense stands this season just as a whole. So let me say that. But against an offense like Houston, they didn't have any answers. They really didn't. It was players making plays that changed the course of the game that allowed them to win. Great. The secondary has got to find a way to get back to the basics. They were better early this season, and the stats back that up. But now, and I don't know if it's the grind of the season or what, but they are not making plays when they're there. Brandon Crosley had a chance to make a play on a ball, and Keyshawn Carter goes over him, kind of, and catches it for a touchdown. Um, you're you're bouncing off of Clayton Toon, who's a big dude, but you've got to make some tackles here. The secondary is is definitely not capitalizing at all on opportunities to make plays. And there's a talent deficiency in the secondary just overall. Brian Massey's not himself. He's not playing with good technique, which could cover up some of his issues right now with how he's feeling probably physically. Um, Brandon Crosley, who's had a really good month uh, of October, wasn't making too many plays. Uh, Nick Roberts was the only one who really capitalized. And then you've got Sam Westfall and Armani Johnson and Jahari Rogers who just you really struggled overall. And part of that is, okay, the secondary isn't making plays at all, but you did not get any semblance of a pass rush in this game. And that's really tough. And once again, by the way, they were out. Well, they were without Stefan Wright. And that's a big piece. Um, and so that's important to note. They didn't have him. But they didn't get help from Jalen Samuels. They didn't get help from um, really any of these guys that have stepped up uh, in the pass rush at all. Um, Nelson Paul had one sack. Um, but other than that, they had a, a few quarterback hurries. Uh, granted, 56, I believe, pass attempts, uh, 53 pass attempts for Clayton Toon. You've got to do better, though. I mean, the, the run game for Houston, I mean, they ran the ball five times outside of Clayton Toon. Um, and it had success, a 52-yard uh, run for Stacy Sneed. But that was it. So you didn't even have to respect the true run game of it. And they just didn't get home at all. And that is what probably had the secondary left out to dry the most. And, and it's concerning. And Houston's offense is good. So, like, credit to them as well. Just like credit to SMU for ripping apart Doug Belk's defense. But they've got to find ways now to go back to the drawing board, figure out, let's get back to getting pressure. Let's get back in the secondary to playing fundamentally well. Maybe they need a confidence booster of playing a USF team that just lost to Temple, I believe, something like 56 to 28. And that's why Jeff Scott's out of a job. But what they put out there on Saturday was it's just not acceptable. It's never going to be acceptable. Um, and they've got to kind of look themselves in the mirror now. They've got a week that you're playing an inferior opponent now. They've got to look themselves in the mirror, find a way to put together some confidence like they had, honestly, going into October. And find a way to get back to some of those things where they're making more consistent game-changing plays, a sack on a third down, an interception uh, like they've had again, like they had against Houston, or a fumble return for a touchdown like they had against Tulsa, or forcing a fumble like Junior Ajo did against Tulsa. They've got to make those plays collectively much more so than they did against Houston because there wasn't any. There wasn't anything stopping the Cougars. Now, I think the Cougars' offensive totals, which are, I believe they had 710 yards of offense. I'm trying to, yep, 710 total yards of offense. They basically didn't have a run game outside of Clayton Toon. 528 total passing yards. And their average starting field position uh, was ridiculous. I mean, that was uh, some of the worst special teams coverage that I've seen out of SMU in quite some time. Um, average yards uh, on their returns. Uh, was 23 point or no, uh, 20, 20.1 on the kickoff return. So actually not bad. 
uh, from what I'm what I'm seeing here, it doesn't add up uh, from what I saw. Um, and and maybe that's because some of them are are touchbacks or whatnot. And and I'm trying to find that. Esme had three touchbacks on the night. Um, but they, they've got to they've got to shut that down. I mean, there it was just it was poor. I mean, it was really really bad. And so Houston had uh, really good opportunities to start with the ball um, in good field position early on in the game. Uh, they had two of their first five drives started at the 40 yard line or better. Uh, they started at the 35 in the second. They started at the 33. Uh, they started at the 40, the 44. And then they were kind of backed up a little bit on two of their last four drives. But even then they started at the 34 and 44 to close things out. This was, just, it was just a really poor special teams performance by SMU on the uh, kick return coverage side on SMU side. Uh, with their own return game, I thought they had a pretty good um, start in that front. Uh, they started at 37, 38. Uh, they started, of course, the opening drive on the 41. Um, they were able to, you know, kind of set themselves up pretty well uh, in some situations. Um, but again, consistency. And I know SME lost three starters on special teams kick coverage units earlier this year when, you know, three of the four guys uh, that, that, haven't been playing down the stretch, I should say, including Chase Camardi, who's no, no longer on the team. Those guys were key starters for them on special teams, but somebody's got to step up. And, you know, Houston has always been a good special teams team. Uh, you know, obviously last year with Marcus Jones taking that back uh, to win the game, that was obviously a, another example of Houston eating up SMU on special teams. But, um, you know, Brendan Hall, three touchbacks on uh, however many kickoffs he had. I'm <laughs> pretty wild. Uh, for him, but uh, the kick coverage unit was just not good, not good enough. They've got to clean some things up on that front. They work on it a lot. I mean, it's not like they don't uh, give Craig Niver time, but um, they've got to figure out a way to get some guys out there that'll help them a little bit more, especially against Tulane, especially against Memphis. Memphis has obviously had success as well against SMU on that front too. Um, so that is something they've really got to clean up for sure. Um, but other than that, I mean, I got to say, and and Dana Holgerson, I thought was a good press conference to watch because in his days, he's been through games like this plenty of times um, with some of the shootouts he's been involved with. You, you, you just got to be happy, first of all, about a win. I mean, and to send Houston packing. I mean, Houston's hype video was about settling the score one final time in case SMU and Houston don't, don't play again for a long time. Um, and SMU settled the score. And they did it in the black uniforms, which were awesome. I think they came out great. Um, everybody, all the players seemed to love them. I had a couple of recruits uh, tell me they loved them as well. Um, and so, you know, the momentum just right now is, is it's back to being on the positive side for SMU. Defensively, special teams, they've got to get better. They've got to figure out a way to clean up what happened against Houston because that was unacceptable. But – you know, the, that was how the offense, when Rhett Lashley was hired and brought back, that was how it was supposed to look. That was the reason why Rhett Lashley was hired, was a, was a performance like that. And they have got to be feeling good about themselves. If you're an SMU fan, you got to be feeling good. Just in general right now, they, they've strung together two wins that, let's just say, one, Tulsa, they haven't won there since 2009. That explains itself. Houston, I mean, I would say in the past, and I was having a conversation with somebody about this on Friday, and I was kind of explaining to them, you know, kind of what it's what it's been like and why SMU hasn't broken through and either taken advantage of great teams like they've had seven and 0, eight and 0, whatever, and then fallen off, or you know, why it's it's kind of a a, a difficult place to win at times. And it's because of the games like the Houston game on Saturday. In the past, I would say those games haven't necessarily gone SMU's way or SMU hasn't shown up. You know, they get the first win at Tulsa since 2009. Okay, they do it with a true freshman quarterback for half of it. And then they don't show up for the second game, the next game. And this weekend, SMU showed up, especially offensively, and the defense made three plays that changed the game, and they were able to win. And Rhett Lashley just – made mincemeat of Doug Belk, who I think anyone on a SMU message board would have killed to be the hire, first of all, for SMU if they'd taken 
Houston's defensive coordinator. It wouldn't have happened, but that's how well-respected he is. He was a guy last year that interviewed for multiple big-time Power 5 defensive coordinator jobs. I'm pretty sure he makes over a million dollars now. Um, I could be wrong on that, but he is that well-respected nationally, and Rhett Lashley just tore him apart. This, these, this next three-game stretch, I would argue, is one of the most important in SMU's modern history. You have beaten Houston. You vanquished the demons of going up to play Tulsa. And now you have certainly a trap game with, a, with an interim coach against USF. And then you have a Thursday night game at Tulane, who's sitting in the top 25 right now, who you've beaten also seven straight times. And then you have your usual pesky Memphis team that always plays you tough. If you come away with three straight wins to close out this season, well, sorry, if you come away with five straight wins to close out the season or even go four and one, that's saying something about the direction of the program. And that's been the difference between where this program has been in the past, we've completely fallen off the reservation late in seasons, and where it can siphon big momentum on the field for the transfer portal season, for maybe early signing day. There's not many targets left on the board for the Mustangs. We'll have more on that later this week on the message boards for on the Pony Express subscribers. And then go into the spring feeling good about what you put together in year one after you lost multiple NFL skill players um, after the 2021 season. You had a new coaching staff come in and clearly have some areas of talent deficiencies that look just got to be fixed, but they've overcome them now as of late. So if you can reel off five straight wins or even four and one, that's momentum going into the offseason that this program hasn't seen. It really hasn't. So huge, huge three-game stretch. SMU got past Houston. Wild one. I mean, I in the past, I've always watched like Big 12 games. And when the Big 12 was truly in its heyday with some of those insane scores that were going around, you know, the Patrick Mahomes game at Texas Tech, um, I forgot even who the other team on that uh, side of that was. I think it might have been Oklahoma. I could be wrong. But when it was scoring into the 70s or whatever, I mean, that's just crazy. And they're fun and nobody talks about defense, but like you want your defense to be able to play better. But I don't know. I just I enjoy the I enjoy the crazy offensive games. And SMU, because of their defense, was able to feel relatively comfortable in a sense because of how well their offense was playing. And there's no question that SMU pretty much every drive was gonna score. So I, I think kind of Set yourself up mentally to be let down because that's what has happened to SMU in the past. But at the same time, take a little bit and say, wow, this team just went and vanquished the Tulsa Demons, took it to Houston offensively, and came away with a win when Houston's riding high and all those things. And look, they've got the target on their back because they're leaving, but it was SMU-Houston. It doesn't matter that they were leaving for the Big 12. It was just a rivalry game. And SMU won it. They've got momentum going down the stretch in November for the first time. That game, that win over Houston, has got to give you a little bit of confidence that they can win down the stretch versus fold. It's not necessarily an easy stretch, but Memphis is not the usual Memphis team. USF is very down. The one sandwiched in the middle is Tulane who has really been playing well, but at the same time, SMU has beat them seven straight times, and Tulane has to play UCF and Cincinnati in there too. So it's just getting difficult for the green wave. It's a winnable three-game stretch. It's the biggest three-game stretch in SMU modern history, in my opinion. They come out on the other side of it with a 4-1 and one or 5-0 and oh finish this season. That's momentum you can ride as a first-year coaching staff and would be huge heading in to the 2023 year um, for the Mustangs as they'll mine the transfer portal and go on the recruiting trail. We'll talk a lot about recruiting on Tuesday afternoon because SMU did have a huge group of 2024 recruits on campus Sunday. Be sure to check out on theponyexpress.com for notes on that. A lot of key targets for the staff that were on the hilltop. Um, and I did place a new on three recruiting prediction machine 
pick in for the Mustangs to land one of those top targets. If you aren't on the message board, subscribe today. Seven-day free trial. Get a free Founders Club hat. We still have a few left. Jump on board. A lot of momentum with the Mustangs after two straight wins. A lot of momentum on theponyexpress.com as well. SB Basketball opens its regular season Monday night in Moody Coliseum, 7 p.m. against Texas A&M Commerce on ESPN+. Plus. Check that out. We'll have your coverage with Liam Fitzgibbon there in Moody Coliseum. Um, appreciate all you guys who listen to the podcast and have subscribed to the YouTube channel. Check it out. We also got highlights of Jackson Lavender, who we'll talk about um, tomorrow as well on the podcast uh, as SMU um, looks really poised to uh, sign for the most part. I think their entire class right now that they have committed. We'll talk more about recruiting on Tuesday on the podcast as well as recap SMU's SMU basketball season opener against Texas A&M Commerce. So with that, guys, hope you enjoy this edition of the podcast. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and wherever you catch your podcast at. And uh, we'll catch you at ontheponyexpress.com as a lot of news to come, both hoops, football, and recruiting. So be sure to check it out, and we will catch you guys next time uh, for another edition of the podcast. Thanks for listening.